What's going on? It's been a while since I did any flight sim uh, videos. So I've been playing around with some stuff. I just recently downloaded the AccuSim uh, add-on expansion for the A2A P47. And I updated my AccuSim to the latest version. So they're telling me the P47 is now at version 1.2. I don't think it's been updated for a long time, so it's been at that, at that uh, level for quite a while. You know, Airplane Heaven's coming out with a, a bubble top uh, Thunderbolt, which I'm kind of looking forward to. I like the bubble top version as well. So what we're going to do is a historical flight here. This is uh, the last flight of Neil Kirby. And if you don't know who Neil Kirby was, he was uh, a, well, a famous Thunderbolt pilot from the uh, World War II in the Pacific Theater, one of only two Thunderbolt pilots to be awarded the Medal of Honor in the entire war. So, but he was killed on March the 5th, 1944, on this particular flight that we're going to do today from a bay, from a place called Sador in New Guinea. So if we look at the map here, let's see if I can zoom out so we can see what, where we are and give a little background. Okay, so. Can I zoom out any more than that? One more time. There we go. So this is New Guinea. Australia's down here to the south. This is uh, New Britain or New Ireland, I think. The Rabal, Rabal was uh, based, was on this island here main Japanese base and um, so you know Japan's way up way up here to the north west so basically the Allies stopped the Japanese invasion of Port Moresby and then they started pushing back and if you read Saburo Sakai's book a lot of his combat took place out of this air base right here at Leh and they were going back and forth to Port Moresby. And then the Allies invaded Guadalcanal, which is up here somewhere in the Solomon Islands. And, um, you know, the Japanese kind of pulled back a little bit to Rabaul and then started, you know, repelling the Guadalcanal. They were trying to fight on two fronts, basically. They were fighting in the Solomons and they were fighting in New Guinea. And uh, so anyway, the Allies were gradually pushing them back like this to the west towards the Philippines and right back to Japan. So on this date, the 348th fighter group flying Thunderbolts was uh, at this base here, Sador, Sador. And we're going to fly up to the Wiwak area here, which was a Japanese base. And earlier in the day, uh, Richard Bong and Thomas Lynch had flown their P-38s up there and had some success in the area. So later in the afternoon, you know, because there was a bit of an ace race going on at the time, you know, Neil uh, Kirby wanted to be the best. So he decided to take his chances as well. And he took three, him and two other guys uh, went up to the same area. And they also enjoyed some success, except uh, Neil was shot down. And he was killed. Um, he managed to jump out of his airplane and, and parachute into the jungle. But I, apparently he got caught up in a tree. And he died of gunshot wounds. So whether he was shot in the airplane or by somebody on the ground while he was hanging from a tree, uh, we don't really know. But... Most likely he was shot while he was in his airplane. I mean, why else would he have to jump out of it, right? So we're going to play the role of Bill Dunham flying this airplane here. This was an early D2 model. 
Uh, Neil Kirby's airplane was a D4. It didn't have water injection and it didn't have wing tanks. But so we're going to carry a belly tank. Now the way I've got it configured, we've got ammunition, a 75 gallon drop tank, oxygen, no ADI, and no fuel in the auxiliary tank. Uh, it's not a long flight, really. It's only about an hour, not even maybe. So I figure, you know, we'll use the drop tank fuel to get there. And then when we drop the drop tank fuel, we'll have an optimum center of gravity. We won't have any fuel in the auxiliary tank for doing combat. I don't know if that's what they did or not, but it seemed like a good idea to me. So, so let's look at this Thunderbolt up close. This model's been out for several years now, 2009, I think. This is a high resolution, a high resolution skin done by uh, Lewis Bloomfield, I think his name is. I think he's part of the A2A crew in some capacity. So there's your exhaust wastegate right there. The uh, manifold pressure regulator would control that, the amount of exhaust that goes back to the turbo, which is back here. Or back here, I guess, in this area. The turbo exhaust is back here. And um, so, yeah, this is, Thunderbolt was turbocharged, so had good high altitude performance. So normally the flaps would be down because they didn't want people stepping on the flap. So by putting it down, that basically prevented people from walking on it when they were trying to climb up into the airplane. Uh, trim tab only on the left aileron and elevators and rudder retractable fully retractable tail wheel 850 caliber machine guns and a 2000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 that's 2800 cubic inches 18 cylinders in two rows air-cooled radial engine You know, I'm, I'm, I'm partial to aerodynamic airplanes, so usually I like the inline liquid-cooled types. Spitfire probably being my favorite, followed very closely by the P-38 Lightning and, of course, the Mustang. But I think if I, if I actually had to go to war, I think the Thunderbolt or the Corsair would be the airplane of choice just because there is so much protection for the pilot uh, in, in the form of that engine and the lack of a liquid cooling system. Armor plating, you know, high speed capability and 850 caliber machine guns. You know, if you manage your speed and keep your speed up, you have a good chance of success flying this airplane. As Neil Kirby sh uh, showed the pilots in the theater, some of them had their doubts some lightning uh, squadrons had to actually trade their airplanes in for Thunderbolts, and they weren't too happy about it. <clears throat> All right, so am I recording? I just got to make sure I'm recording here. I think I am. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. So in the cockpit, very, very well detailed. I mean, A2A does good work. Uh, a couple, couple areas of the flight model that are a little suspect to me. We'll, we'll look at that as we're flying. I think some improvements can be made. And some of the systems are not 100% uh, modeled either, even with the AccuSim. And we'll talk about that too. So starting on the left side, flap handle is down, flaps are down, trims neutral. Landing gear handle is down. Uh, fuel selector is off. You want to make sure that's off and that your mixture is in idle cutoff. The uh, belly tank selector is off. Throttle's cracked open a little bit. Propeller is maximum RPM. 
propeller switch is an automatic. We can turn our generator switch on. Now this, this is one of the things that's not quite modeled accurately. Um, but at least they did. They did model it, at least. Uh, this, this rheostat knob here. Each fuel tank, the main and the auxiliary, had its own fuel pump, auxiliary fuel pump, in addition to the engine-driven pump. And so whenever the fuel selector, like since my mixture is an idle cutoff, I'm going to turn the selector to main. So now the pump would be on. Uh, as soon as I turn the battery on, since we have electrical power, I'm pretty sure that pump is going to be on. And um, so if your mixture is not in idle cutoff, you're going to be pumping fuel right into the engine and you're going to flood. You'll flood the engine and probably have a, a good fire on your hands when you try to start it. And so that's, uh, you know, the A2A checklist kind of, that's the way they have you start the engine. They, they have you turn the pump to emergency speed with the mixture in rich, and that's really not what you should do in the real world. Um, so like I was saying, yeah, these pumps are variable speed, the auxiliary pumps. So this knob would control the speed. If your pressure was low, you would just turn it up a little bit, increase the speed of the pump. But normally it would be in the start position here. It's, uh, it's not actually off. It's just running at normal speed as opposed to emergency speed or high speed. But that's a, that's a minor point, very minor point. You can still start the engine uh, with it in the start position, even though it says it's off. Um, okay, so ammeter is here. No amps because we don't have electrical power. Anyway, we'll keep going around the cockpit here. Magnetos are ah, uh, we'll put them, turn them on to both. We can unlock our controls, so we can move them around. Uh, we're going to cage, we'll cage the gyro horizon there. Set our altimeter to field elevation. Check our compass. Make sure the compass uh, headings are the same. Oxygen supply is good. Manifold pressure is ambient pressure. Carburetor air temperature. See, so we're in the Pacific, so it's warm. And we might have some difficulty keeping the uh, temperatures under control here. Cockpit ventilation, yes. Cockpit vent is open. Oxygen lever is in normal. You get two settings, normal and emergency, or 100% oxygen. And the emergency valve is off, and the tailwheel is unlocked for taxiing. And Neil's going through his cockpit check right now, too. Uh, okay, what else we got to do here? Let's turn the battery on now. And we notice that the, the cowl flaps are also open. That's good. Cowl flap control is here. Engine primer is here. So our landing gear light just is on, which is good. Green light. And so yeah, we have uh, intercooler doors, oil cooler doors. Now the intercooler controls the carburetor intake temperature is this gauge here and so in the you know in the warm climate here with that that uh, shutter control should be open so I'm gonna open that and I'm gonna put the oil cooler in neutral and we can test some lights we have a low pressure uh, low fuel pressure light up here and we have a low fuel level light here. And we have a turbo overspeed light here. So we can test that with the switch here. That works. 
Uh, we can, with the switch up here, we get our low fuel pressure. Switch down, we get our low fuel warning or level. And switch in neutral is off. And the rest is navigation lights and cockpit lights and stuff that we don't need. Compass light, oil dilution, pedo heat. Anyway, so we're ready to start. Um, so we're going to prime. I'm going to go four strokes on the primer. So your inertia starter is here, ignition's on. So we're gonna wind it up for 15 seconds, no more than 20, where it says energize there. And then we're gonna flip the switch to engage and hopefully the engine starts. Mixture is still in idle cutoff. It should always be in cutoff when the engine is not running. So here we go. As soon as the engine uh, fires, we'll put the mixture in auto rich. Here we go, 15 seconds. Oop, here's your clock over here. So you can count 15 seconds. Go. Start. Come on. There she goes. Mixture goes to rich. Auto rich. And we'll warm up at a thousand RPM until we have 40, minimum 40 degrees on the oil. <clears throat> now I'm using a program called JoinFS, which allows you to record a flight and then play it back. And that's what I did to get Neil Kirby's flight here. So we're going to start to take the playback rolling now so that Neil can start his engine and we can follow him along. So while the engine's warming up, we'll test the hydraulic system by raising the flaps. You can see the angles are marked on the flap itself. And in this airplane, they recommended that you wear oxygen at all times due to gas fumes in the cockpit. Same as the Hawker Typhoon. <laughs> so we're going to close the canopy and then put our oxygen mask on. And we're going to wait for Neil to go through his startup check. Flaps are up. You want to leave the handle in the up position. And one of the other thing that's not quite modeled right here is the, the turbo and the throttle. They've modeled it as if there's no manifold pressure regulator. So you have to open the throttle as you climb, kind of like the P40. And that's not how it worked in this airplane. Full throttle would give you 45 inches on the ground. And then this, this turbo control full forward would give you the 52 inches takeoff power. And you wouldn't have to adjust that with altitude. But uh, in this model, we can actually over boost the engine on the ground or below about 7,000 feet with just the throttle control without even using the turbo. So got to be careful there. Okay, his engine's running now. I'm going to taxi out. We have, uh, I think it looks like we got about 34 on the oil. Not quite there, not quite at our 40 minimum. 
tailwheel's unlocked. Let's uh, release the brakes, the parking brake. And taxi. I'm going to taxi to the far side of the runway. Oil pressure is good. Cylinder head temperatures are coming up. 2,000 RPM. Something like that. I'm going to stop here. And we'll watch Neil so we can follow him. I'm not going to use flaps for takeoff. <clears throat> Since we're really not that heavy. Like I said, I don't have uh, any fuel in the auxiliary tank. So 52 inches and 2,700 RPM should give us 2,000 horsepower for takeoff. Okay, he's taxiing. We're going to lock our tailwheel. Fiery Ginger 4. There she goes. Okay, he's going to lock his tailwheel and then we're going to go. Hold the brakes. We'll open the throttle up a little bit. 30 inches or so. There he goes. Here we go. 52 inches. As soon as the tail comes up, we start pulling back a little bit. And we're off the ground. Okay, landing gear going up. Man, he's climbing pretty steep. I'm going to climb at about 150, indicated, somewhere around there. Throttle at 52 inches. All right. A little tricky flying in formation here. I don't want to. Don't want to lose them because it'll be hard to get hard to find them again. Need some nose up trim here a little bit. There we go. flaps open for a little while here. Some of our temperatures are in the red almost. Carburetor temperature is hot. I'm going to adjust my viewpoint so my gun sight is more centered. There we go. All right, so our fuel consumption right now should actually be about 275 gallons an hour, according to the book. And if you look, it's only about uh, 220, so it's a little low. And that's with auto-rich mixture. And I found that it's, uh, it's, a, it's pretty low in cruising flight as well. Neil's pulling away from us here. What's going on? I'm almost at full throttle now. These cowl flaps are going to add a lot of drag as well. Uh-oh. Big stutter there. Like that. 
Yeah, hopefully there's not too much stuttering going on. I got, uh, I don't know what effect this join FS is going to have on frame rates. You know, because it's playing back a recorded flight. And I'm also recording a, a, a video at the same time, so we'll see what happens. Uh-oh, I thought I lost him. There he is. I don't know what the draw distance is for join F for the recorder for the playback. I think if he gets too far away, he's just going to disappear. But yeah, it's a pretty cool application, pretty cool uh, little program for practicing, you know, formation flying or whatever. I plan to do more of that in the future. Okay, we're catching up to him now. Let's throttle back a little bit. 45 inches. Let's go maximum continuous power. 42 inches and 25.50 on the RPM. So between 25 and 2600 there. And we'll keep the power up about 42 inches or so. So stay in formation. You want to fly in the main tank for about 10 minutes or so. Because I guess the vapor return, the carburetor uh, vapor return or whatever, goes back to the main tank. So at the, at the rate of about 10 gallons an hour. So you want to burn off enough fuel that there's enough space in there that it doesn't uh, overfill. A little, little turbulence there. Yeah, Neil's bobbing around too. Okay, the cylinder head temperatures are under control, so we're going to close the cowl flaps a little bit. Lose a little bit of drag there. All right, Neil, I lost you. Where are you? There you are. So the other pilot that was on this mission was Samuel Blair, and I haven't been able to find any details about his airplane, but um, two out of three ain't bad, as the saying goes. What's interesting too is uh, Neil had three sons and all three of them were killed in aviation accidents. Two of them uh, were flying a Cessna 140 when it crashed into power lines near Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1974. And his other son died in 1977. I don't know the details of that accident but apparently it was also an aviation accident. So that's kind of creepy when you think about it. Okay, I'm at full throttle now. We're going to have to start using the turbo here above uh, 10,000 feet. So we'll just push the lever up very slowly. It's very sensitive, so just a little bit. And then don't over boost. Pull your just to keep your power around 42 inches. All right, slow down, slow down here a little bit. Getting kind of close. There we go. There we go. Nice. So, you know, I, I hope this video gives and it gives you an idea of what it looked like in the area. You know, what it looked like flying down the coast of uh, northern New Guinea. 
on the afternoon of March the 5th, 1944. So yeah, they climbed up to about 22,000 feet, so I read. Or 20, I think I got up to 21,000 or something when I recorded it, which is close enough. So yeah, 42 inches and 2550 RPM. An auto rich mixture should give should be 210 gallons an hour and we're at 130 so we have a little bit of a fuel consumption problem here I'll have to sort that out yeah cylinder temperatures are under control we're gonna close the cowl flaps now all the way Carburetor temperature is still warm. We'll leave the intercooler doors open. Oil temperatures are under control. So we'll just leave the oil cooler doors in neutral. You can see the turbo uh, light is flashing. I think it's anywhere between 5,000 RPM and the red line. It'll be flashing. If it goes solid, that means you're, uh, it's either not turning fast enough, or it's not turning at all, it's uh, off, or it's over speed, over speeding. I have real weather turned on, so there's not too many clouds and not too much turbulence, so that's pretty good. look around here. That's the Bismarck Sea over there. And there's the jungles and mountains of northern New Guinea. And we lost Neil. There he is. <laughs> That's why I don't want to look around too much because you lose uh, contact with your You got a formation flying is a bit is challenging enough as it is without trying to look around, <laughs> losing sight. All right, it's coming back into view here now. There we go. to record this video yesterday and um, I didn't realize that shadow play was recording the microphone at the same time as my uh, recorder my other recorder so I was double recording the sound and when I played it back it was like huge stuttering and echoes and so hopefully this turns out better So yeah, what's going on in the flight sim world? Uh, <laughs> and that was a joke, flight sim world. Yeah, that uh, dovetails released that 
open access or early access, whatever you want to call it, open beta, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I look forward to the day when I can use a 64-bit application, you know, um, with DirectX 11 or 12 or whatever they're up to now. You know, that's one thing I don't get with FSX is the shadows, the uh, cockpit shadows and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to that, but not if I can't fly, you know, a P-47. <laughs> or, you know, any other military, good military model, that, like A2A or anybody else makes. I think eventually they're going to upgrade update their stuff to be compatible, but in the meantime, and I heard some rumblings about them uh, tweaking the flight model a little bit. I haven't seen any official, uh, any official memos to that effect, but Nova Wing 24 on his video there, he had said that they're, they changed the modeling of the wing or something. They're modeling each wing separately. And they always did, really. Um, by that, I mean there's two ways you can model it. You can have geometry-based model. and calculate the, the aerodynamic forces on the geometry. And you can do it a, a coefficient based model, which is what this is. But it's, it's still, I mean, if the airplane can spin and roll, each wing is modeled separately, regardless of which, which method you use. Um, you know, I can roll the airplane. So obviously one aileron's, you know, having an effect and the other one's having the opposite effect. So it's, you're still modeling the wing in in two sections. It's just uh, a different way of doing it, that's all. You know, I mean, Microsoft was in the process of changing from a coefficient-based model to a geometry-based model because it's easier for the end user to just put in the geometry, you know. Uh, Calculating the coefficients is, is not an easy task for anyone. Even if you know what you're doing. So having the uh, you know the simulator calculate the aerodynamic forces based on the on the geometry is much better is a much better way to go, I think, in the long run. And that's how X Plane does it. And some other simulators, some combat simulators, you know, probably aces high. Uh, probably does that as well. In War Thunder, I have no idea, but they probably do that as well. So, so we'll see. You know, some of the things in the aircraft config work. Some of them don't have an effect on the uh, flight model. So we'll see. The biggest area of improvement in the flight modeling that I would like to see is stability margins. Center of gravity is important, or it should be important. It's not important in FSX, apparently, um, the way most people model their airplanes. So, you know, having a geometry-based flight model where the tail surfaces actually give you realistic stability margins, that's, that's the biggest improvement I'm looking for in the flight model. Um, And that's tricky. That's a bit tricky. You know, as, a, as someone who was developing a combat flight simulator a few years ago, uh, the flight model anyways on it, there's a lot of things to account for where pitch control is concerned so that the airplane doesn't feel, you know, too touchy or twitchy or bouncy or whatever. You know, if you don't if you don't account for the uh, three-dimensional lift slope of a surface and the downwash angle over the tail, uh, you're going to have an, an overly sensitive 
airplane, possibly even on the on the on the borderline of you know being not controllable. <laughs> you know, we had a bug. We had a bug in our flight model where we were only using half the downwash angle. Why is Neil pulling away from me here? What's going on? So yeah, the you know the project was cancelled before we could get those bugs fixed officially. And we didn't have the resources, you know, we didn't have the ability to compete with, like, War Thunder, which is basically doing exactly what we were trying to do. And, uh, you know, if you look at the content in that game, it's unbelievable, you know, the amount of, of content and how quickly they add content. So, but again, games like that, as, as pretty as the graphics are and, and they don't have the fidelity of the systems of the airplane like the way this one does, right? Like the way A2A models every, you know, all the systems, all the switches, all the light switches, and, and everything else in the cockpit, so. But we had a pretty good flight model, you know, we had, uh, we had uh, multiple speed superchargers, we had uh, engine cooling, Heating and cooling, same as uh, what A2A is doing here with AccuSim. And we also had, you know, we were using PID algorithms for the autopilots and things like that. You know, things were uh, pretty good that way. I'm going to switch to the other side of Neil here. I'm going to get on his left side, or his right side, just for something to do. Yeah, we're at 21,000 feet now, so it's, uh, he's leveling off. did switch to my drop tank today. Well, let's do that now then. In the real airplane, what you would do is throttle back a little bit, 20 inches or so. You would turn the emergency pump on. Then you would switch to your, to your um, external tanks and turn your belly tank on. And then you would... Uh, Put your switch back in normal. So we should be using, I don't think I did that right. I should have switched the second, uh, should have switched the second secondary selector first before changing to the external tanks there. But anyway, so our engine hesitated for a second. But it's all good. Look at external view here while well, we're nice and stable in formation. Take a look around. smoke there. I'm not sure what that is. Hopefully the engine's okay. <laughs> Temperatures look okay. 
And the last Neil again. Ah, bugger. Where is he? Probably. He's above me? Below me? What? Where is he? Behind me now? Shoot. I lost him. Is he below me? We were flying nice and stable there for a minute. What the hell happened? <laughs> Alright, let's take a look around. Where is he? He's got to be around here somewhere. Can't be too far away. Oh, there he is. He's way over there. Whoa. Okay, I'm going to hit the brakes here. Let's throttle back. Come back to the right a little bit. Get back in line. a little bit. Yeah, we need to slow down here. This might be where I pulled back to cruise setting. So, 32 inches and 2250 RPM. We can put the mixture in auto lean. our maximum continuous lean setting. Okay, Neil should be over here somewhere now. There he is. And he's coming back up. Okay. And I'm going to come back on the turbo a little bit. Maybe that's... Uh, Causing us some problems. Yeah, that's one thing they, they warn in the manual not to do is have the turbo lever ahead of the throttle. Okay, here we go. Back in formation. More or less. Push the boost up a little bit. Just a wee bit. There we go. Yeah, so 32 inches and 2550 should give us 110 gallons an hour. And as you can see here, you know, it's, again, the fuel consumption is really low. 
with the, even with the mixture in auto lean, we're down to below 60 gallons an hour. Fuel consumption's a bit low. Also, I think there's a little too much drag. Like, I should be able to cruise with 30 inches and 2150 RPM. We should be making, like, 210 indicated. Or about 330 true in standard atmosphere, I guess. At 20,000 feet. And we're not even making 200 here with... Uh, 34 inches and 22.50, so I think there's a little too much drag. And Neil's pulling away from me again, so I'm going to go, let's go back to Auto Rich. And push it up to 42 inches again. up There's some funky looking rivers coming up here on the left hand side and lots of trees lots of jungle primitive primitive tribes living in this area during the war some interesting stories if you read some of these uh, wartime accounts and all that kind of stuff. There's a book written by, uh, I can't think of his name now, Richard. Somebody, <laughs> Richard, um, I think it's called War Pilot. He flew lightnings in the Pacific, and I think he flew helicopters too in Vietnam or something like that. But yeah, he's got some good stories. Whoa. You're going to have to slow down here, man. Formation flying is sucking bad here. Should be just out my left wing there. Cool. So this is kind of the position you would want to be in when you're flying combat. Kind of a loose line of breast formation. 
because then if you need to clear the guy's tail you just kind of bank over like this and come over here like this and you can shoot uh, shoot the enemy off his tail he's up above me now And likewise, if someone was attacking me, he could have uh, turned into the attacker and cleared my tail. Teamwork. That's the other thing I don't like about this simulator is the lack of snap views. I like my snap views. That probably comes from flying combat sims, you know. Just being able to snap to the left and snap to the right and snap up. I, mean, I, I think you can I think I can still do it with the keyboard. Um, but I know my joystick hat. You know, it pans, right? It doesn't snap, so it's... Anyway. It would help, definitely help when you're flying combat. You want to be able to look... You want to be able to look up this way quickly. And to the left, snap to the left, snap to the right. When you're maneuvering. Definitely helps. Or I guess if you had track IR or you know these VR headsets that are coming out now, I guess you can do that. But I'm not uh, I'm not ready to go to that level just yet. Another area of the flight model I think needs a little improvement is the, well, we're going to pass them again, the dive performance. Now the P-47 had good dive performance, but it also had a tendency to get into compressibility with a tendency to die, to um, tuck or to dive steeper once it reached compressibility. And I didn't, I didn't notice that in this model, you know, I was able to dive right up to maximum speed without any tendency to dive or to uh, tuck in the dive. Like I've actually got the pilot manual open here. I have a tab open down here with the pilot manual. We can look at, like at this altitude, I think we were res restricted to about 300 knots indicated. about 500 true and above that you know we should get into trouble they added dive recovery flaps to the later models of the Thunderbolt just like they did with the lightning so let's open up the tab here oh that's the engine chart hang on or what page is it on now? There it is there. So there's your, your dive speed limit at 20,000 to 2350 is our restricted speed. 
So let's see what it is at uh, 15,400. 500 below 10,000. So what I did on this flight when I recorded it was I had Neil dive down on the airfield at maximum speed. And he does like a, a strafing pass over the runway and then he pulls up into a climbing like a chandelle and then sets up for a landing. And so I'm going to try and follow him when he does that. And I'm going to see if my airspeed gets up to dangerous levels. <laughs> like if we can hit 350 before we get down to 15,000 feet. Um, you know, we should start getting into trouble. And I don't really recall ever having any trouble recovering from a dive with this model, so we might, might have to look at that area of the flight model a little bit. All right, there's some more funky rivers off to the left. Sun's going down. So apparently when Neil uh, jumped out of his plane there, or when he didn't return to base with the other two pilots, you know, it was getting dark by the time they got back to base, and uh, they wanted to take off again and go looking for him. But they were restrained. Got a little ways to go here. You can just, uh, the airfield is just on this little, this area right here, on these little uh, piece of land that juts out there. So we're getting there. We have a little ways to go yet, but. Now there's no way of knowing how much fuel is in your drop tank unless you know what your fuel consumption is and like I said we have a problem with fuel consumption so but well, you can cheat you can pull up your whoops not that one not that one you can pull up your loading manager here and see how much fuel you have left in your drop tank Yeah, as they approached the field here, they um, they spotted some bombers, some twin-engine bombers over the water that I guess were approaching the airfield. So they dove down and attacked the bombers. And apparently, from what I've read, there's a couple of different accounts. I don't really know. I haven't seen the actual combat reports, but apparently uh, Neil made a second pass on one of the bombers, so he did a like a 360 degree circle to try to attack the bomber again and that's uh, when he got shot down because there was uh, I think four or five type 1 fighters got into the air the Japanese had radar warning in this area from what I've read so they were able to scramble about five fighters One or two of them attacked uh, Neil's airplane at low altitude, probably while he was performing a tight turn, you know, things you're not supposed to do in a P-47. And um, it cost him. Just like uh, Thomas McGuire did as well. I was thinking of doing a video about him as well. So I, 
using the same kind of idea, same concept, using this join FS program and I like that idea. Yeah, there's so many possibilities now. I can do some formation flights. I can escort a bunch of bombers. I can uh, do all kinds of cool stuff. I have some ideas. James Howard. I kind of want to tell his story as well. I have, I've read his book, uh, Roar, Roar of the Tiger, I think it's called. He was the only P-51 pilot in Europe to, uh, to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And one of only two P-51 pilots in the entire war. So, and he was in the Flying Tigers as well before joining the uh, the eighth or the ninth Air Force. I think it was in the 354th Fighter Group. I think it was the Pioneer Mustang Group. I think they were in the ninth Air Force actually. Could be wrong. I'd have to look that up. But I, I think maybe they were transferred to the eighth later or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah, his is a good story to tell. The mission where he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Just make out the airfield there now. Right there. Yeah, we've still got 30 gallons in the external tank. So yeah, it was kind of funny when I was doing this video yesterday. Um, like I said, when I double recorded the the audio and it kind of messed everything up. But uh, the flight ended perfectly. It was like Neil did his pass and then he did. He went around and he landed and I was trying to land right behind him. And I guess I didn't notice that my landing gear wasn't down and locked. Like I I had dropped the gear. The the light was on, saying that the gear was in transit. But then I never checked to make sure it was locked, and so I actually did a belly landing on the runway and, you know, wrecked the airplane, the propeller, everything. I thought it was kind of ironic because uh, instead of Neil Kirby crashing, it was, it was me that crashed. I thought that was kind of funny. I'm not going to do that this time unless, you know, lesson learned, right? Make sure your landing gear's down and locked. Maybe I'll still crash anyway, you never know. This airplane's a little tricky on landing. Drops like a rock. And that's another area of the flight model I think needs a little improvement. Uh, the landing gear drag is just, it's huge. Like you almost need 52 inches of manifold pressure just to maintain altitude with the gear and the flaps down. That might be a bit excessive. I think the Corsair, if I remember correctly, the Corsair uh, only needed like 24 inches of manifold pressure with the flaps down to maintain altitude with the gear and the flaps down. And 18 inches in the clean configuration, so... And 2400 RPM. And, you know, it's a similar, similar sized airplane, similar weight. And it had probably even draggier landing gear, right? With those uh, barn doors dive dive brakes on the front of the landing gear struts so yeah when you, you with this airplane here you, you know if, if you carry 30 inches on the approach your rate of descent is about 1500 feet a minute and um 
you have to come in steep anyways because you can't see over the nose so you're pretty much diving at the runway and uh, you know maybe they maybe that's why they put so much drag in the landing gear just so that you can actually see where you're going when you're making an approach I think it looks like Neil's getting ready to do something here he's gonna dive soon I think so I'm gonna switch back to my I'm gonna drop my drop tank and Neil's gonna drop his tank at the same time because they're for some reason they're connected so we're gonna switch back to the main tank whoops not off main tank on belly tank off pull the handle tank should be gone yep looks like Neil's tank is gone Gonna, he's going to roll over and dive in a, in a minute on the airfield there. So I'm going to get ready to follow him. We're going to want to pull our turbo control back so we don't over boost the engine in the dive. But like I said, that probably wouldn't happen in real life because of the regulator that they're not modeling here. So, you know, it just means you got to watch your manifold pressure a little more closely, that's all. Cal flap should be closed, I think, for diving. Anything over about 250, they said 250 miles an hour and with the cowl flaps open was prohibited. going to go any any minute now I don't want to lose sight of him this time like I did yesterday I mean I found him again just as he was coming over the runway but I kind of want to follow him in the dive just to make it interesting. So we'll get in kind of a line of stern formation here now for our diving attack. here well, doesn't help when you're flying a camouflage airplane oh he's going way down steep okay turbo control is coming back whoa look at him go he's way down there Four fifty. Yeah, we're pushing ten thousand feet. We're within speed limit. There it goes. It's pulling up. It's turning for the runway. There he is. He's still over the water. Full manifold pressure now, 52 inches. Okay, he's 
just going to pass over the end of the runway there now. I think, where is he? I lost him. Walker. Oh, there he is. He's pulling up. Okay, there he goes. Throttle back. This is where I would really like to have the snap view because I could snap up and see him. Yeah, he's throttling way back now, getting down to landing gear speed, 200 miles an hour. There's his landing gear is going down. Okay, my landing gear is going to go down. Okay, we have good landing gear this time. <laughs> trim, trim, trim. And we can drop our flaps now too. Flaps are going down, his flaps are going down. Okay, we're gonna keep about 30 inches of manifold pressure here. Try to keep our speed above 130. Trim the nose up. That's the other thing, there's a lot of nose nose up trim needed when you put the landing gear down. And apparently on the real plane, there was very little trim change with the landing gear, so. Okay, I'm just gonna follow him, because I know he does a good landing. Just gonna do a quick look to make sure my flaps are down. Yep, the flaps are down. Bugger, I lost sight of him. No, there he is, okay. Pretty steep approach. Uh, like I said, 1,500 feet a minute, 2,000 feet a minute. Maintain 130. Yeah, this is going to be scary. <laughs> Hope I don't run into the back of them. a power off approach here 20 inches watch out for the tree okay flare power's coming off Ooh. bounce bouncy bouncy tailwheels locked should have still been locked from when I took off and we're gonna hit the brakes here so we don't run into the back of them because I don't know where he is. Okay, we're gonna open the cowl flaps. And we'll raise the wing flaps. And uh, we'll unlock the tail wheel. And we'll get off the oxygen and open the canopy. And let's do some S-turns while we taxi back here. Oh, there he is. So another thing maybe I'd like to see too is some alternate views in the cockpit so you can actually look to the side a little bit. You know, kind of just offset the view to the left or the right, just a little bit, not too much, just enough that you can kind of see what's going on in front of you. Okay, he's over there on the taxiway.
And the P47 too could taxi without using brakes. You could just use the rudder. It didn't have a steer steerable tailwheel, but apparently there was enough prop blast that the rudder was effective for steering normally. Unless you wanted to pivot around one wheel or something. Okay, so shut down, cylinder temperature is under 200, mixture to idle cut off, when the propeller stops, the ignition will go to off, you want to make sure you burn every last drop of fuel in there, mixture goes to off and the fuel tank selector goes to off, shut the fuel pump off. Generator can go off. And uh, if you heated up the brakes too much on the landing, they didn't recommend setting the parking brake until they cooled off a bit because they would stick, apparently. What's going on here? Set the parking brake. Okay. Nope. Okay. Push the stick forward. Lock the controls. Uh, what else do we have to do here? Turn the... I should have lowered the flaps, I guess. We can still do it. We still have hydraulic pressure, so let's drop the flaps. Cal flaps are open. Let's turn the battery off. And we can use the hand pump even, too, to get some hy hydraulic pressure for pumping the pumping the flaps down so yeah we'll just pump up a little bit here to get some pressure like I said you do, they don't want people walking on the flaps so we'll put them down that should be enough to get them down and Neil's gone because the video, uh, the recording ended. So there you have it, P47. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. And I hope to do some other videos. You know, uh, Thomas McGuire, like I said, and uh, James Howard. So have a good one, and we'll see you later.